Hi, I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I am a professor of chemistry at School of Molecular Sciences. So, Vladi, we're making a video today to look at a topic out of um, Chapter 5 in Atkins Second Edition, but this is something you'll find in almost any um, introductory chemistry and physical chemistry uh, textbook or topic covered, which is, I think of generally as uh, when you start getting into electrochemistry. So whether it be redox chemistry, uh, oxidation reduction, uh, the you know, biochemistry, bioenergetics of ions, et cetera. They like to give it several different names, but, but I think of it all kind of following under kind of electrochemistry, electrobiochemistry. And I think what we, you know, mainly want to um, discuss here today is, as you uh, put it, kind of the relation between the Gibbs and Ernst equation, or basically looking at, um, oftentimes, it, it, Electrochemistry, it's its own chapter. We almost treat it as though it's a separate topic from all the other thermodynamics they learn. And I think one of the points we want to get across today is it's not at all, right? In fact, it's really just another way of looking yeah. at the same thing. Yeah, if you wish, um, the fact that we have something called Nernst equation is primarily because of historical reasons. Because otherwise, we will have a single equation for all chemical reactions including electrochemical reaction. Now, what I think is that historically, they develop in, so, in such a different way that we still teach these things as if they were different, and they are not. Um, but but the, you know, the, this, this particular discussion, and, and I think it's what we have in this introduction, is that when we talk about electrochemistry, in, in many cases, we can decide whether we want to treat a reaction in the or let's say in the conventional way or in the electrochemical way, depending on whether that reaction involves electron transfer or not. Right. And, and and this is a very important connection that very often is But but you know, I think what a lot of students fail to to realize is, like you said, like if it involves, you know, electron transfer, but you know, really, you know, all of a, all of chemistry, more or less, is just the moving of electrons around. I mean, we're rarely outside of what we'll say, we're not going to talk about nuclear chemistry at the moment. I mean, which, you know, outside of maybe introducing a little thing on radioactivity or something, we really don't talk too much about, you know, nuclear chemistry at all. I mean, the nuclei is just there. It's all just electron configurations, electron transfers, right. electron movement. <clears throat> I mean, that's all we do is move electrons right. around. And, and you and if you take, let's say, a particular reaction, let's say Even the formation the, of water. Yeah, the simplest, the first the simplest. one they learn. The hydrogen. formation of water, you can do it in a, in a, in a vessel. You put hydrogen and oxygen. Now you have to be aware that if you do it with large quantities, you will get a huge explosion. <laughs> so you have to be very aware of that. But you can run exactly the same reaction in an electrochemical setup. And then it will happen under control conditions. Yeah. So, but it's the same reaction. In fact, usually the way I always like to state it too is take every freshman chemistry, you know, thing, reaction you initially learned, whether it be, you know, any combustion reaction, whether it be the Haber process, you know, nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia, whether it be, like you said, the formation of water or any of these. I mean, you can put all of these and solve them in an electrochemical kind of basis, right? right. Uh, you can just look up, you know, potentials instead of their kilo, you know, joules uh, yeah. uh, equivalent um, and solve these things. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and, the, and the other thing is the connection with electrical work. And that students get an, an idea about how large quantity a volt is. A volt is a huge quantity in, in chemical terms. Yeah. Because you can, you know, you, you can run many reactions back and forth, applying fractions of a volt. So, so you think of a battery. A battery is 1.5 volts, and you say, "This is nothing." No, it is. It is not nothing. It, it, yeah, <laughs> it is. It is a something. very <laughs> substantial amount. And it, you know what amazes me is, it, like you said, these fields, while they, in a sense, are just one. 
it is amazing how they've developed separately. And, and I'm always in awe of, you know, what we would just generally, you and I would call our electrochemistry colleagues, an electrochemist, someone like a Dan Buttry or, a, you know, um, they, they think in terms of electron volts, in terms of volts. Like, right. I mean, you can just see, and, and it is amazing, even though I get the connection between it, like I think in terms of kilojoules, kilojoules. in terms of, and it, it kind of reminds me of, you know, kind of the U.S. versus, well, everywhere else in the world as far as Celsius and Fahrenheit or something like that. It's amazing how ingrained just units alone yeah, yeah. really affect things. Because they, 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 you think they, in terms convey, of those quantities. They convey a, a mental image. Yeah. And, and, and this everyday picture in science sometimes is not, is not good advice. Yeah. So, and so like you said, like, uh, you know, I think... You know the the really you know deep connection is you know that we're often and and we you know we often see you know this starting and and I always like to just you know remind students that you know as I always because I, I, I'm so bad at remembering anything I always just remember what I think of as kind of the combined first second law where you have you you'll have heat which it'll be you know reversible. Um, uh, we'll, we'll think of uh, kind of reversible heat systems and, and um, we'll just have kind of mechanical work here. I'm going to leave out uh, chemical work, electrical work, everything else is just being just that extra work, right? For uh, starting, it's just, you know, extra work. And then we uh, double Legendre transform that. So we'll flip signs and, um, you know, uh, flip uh, dependent variables here. Uh, and, you know, it's usually, and so you would have this kind of extra, you know, you know, this extra work term here, right? Like any extra work, whether it be electrical work, whether it be chemical work, et cetera. And a lot of when we're looking at electrochemistry here, we're doing these electrochemical cells kind of under constant right. temperature and pressure <clears throat> conditions. And we're really focusing in on this, you know, extra work term. Right, and then immediately this extra work term that you have here, is what gives rise to this connection, which is a very deep connection because it tells you that the change in free energy at constant P and T is equal to the, what is called useful work. Right. Right, or electrochemical work. And, and, and this, is a, this is an extremely important connection, and particularly for chemistry and biochemistry students because the, the concept of work in chemistry, we seldom use it. And it should be, you know, what you pay to the to the to the electrical company. Uh, you, you 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 plug in there in the in the outlet your your telephone or whatever, or even better an iron. What are you paying for? You are paying for using the electrons to do electrical work at home. This is what you are paying for. Yeah. So you take electrons at a high potential. You use your iron. You iron your clothes, and then you return the electrons with lower energy. So you pay for that. You have these are your slaves there working for you and so but this is chemistry too yeah. but it is not the type of chemistry and this is what it, that we usually teach but this is what is involved here that the change in free energy is equal to that particular work right right well and you know half the time after we teach some of these basics that's all we sit and do whether whether it's be you know we now wirelessly charge our cell phones so we use some induction property and so we use some magnetic you know, work. To, you know, uh, whether we have high surface areas, and so we we start to account for the extra surface energy right. work term. But it's always just adding these extra work terms. So you, so you mean that this thing is not like an iron? It's not quite yeah, like an. It's close. <laughs> it's it's right. close. You know. <laughs> so I see. Um, so the, the the other thing that we need here, I mean, this number here. Because very often this is confused with an, uh, you know, it's, it's the geometric coefficient. But in fact... Yeah, and we usually, so like you said, like, well, oh, I don't yeah. think we, I think we fight for this. Like, uh, so usually, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, uh, sometimes uh, we use a new a Greek letter for this. But this thing here is the, the number of electrons involved in the reaction, in the, in the electrochemical reaction. And as it turns out, this quantity, the, the, the cell potential, this is an intensive quantity. Doesn't depend on that, 
on how, whether you multiply the whole equation by a constant number. Right. Whereas this quantity does depend on that. Yeah. So, but the, the, the fact is that precisely this equation, the, the presence of this N here tells you that the electrochemical potential would be the give free energy divided by the number of electrons involved in the effective reaction. So whether right. you multiply by a constant or not, it, w it won't make any difference for the electrochemical potential, and it will make a difference for yeah. the Yeah, and this, you know, constant, the Faraday constant is taking it on that per electron, right. you know, basis. And so, uh, but you're right, like, it's one of the most common, you know, mistakes uh, made by students because, like you said, uh, when they're looking at this um, extra, you know, this work term, when they're looking at the free energy, they're used to treating the free energy, um, you know, extensively uh, like you would the enthalpy or uh, the entropy or something else where you're, when you're calculating things, you know, there's a couple things they get used to doing there. You know, there's say several chemical equations that are going on, reactions that are going on to give you an overall delta G, a delta H of the um, of, of an overall process. And so they're used to, okay, well, we need to balance this and stuff. So when they multiply, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, I need two number of moles up here. They're used to multiplying yeah. that uh, energy by those stoichiometric coefficients. And they're used to flipping the sign when they flip the reaction. Well, that, that part still applies here, but what yeah. doesn't is because this is intensive, you know, even when you multiply by an extra term, you know, the volts that it, it when you have it no. in units of voltage like that, you don't. Right. Um, and, and the other thing that this further is constant, you know, we're used to think of moles of atoms and molecules, but in fact, this refers to one mole of electrons. electrons yeah. One mole of electrons. So this is the charge of one mole of electrons in coulombs, which is about 96 coulombs or so, 96,000 coulombs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the electric charge of one mole of electrons. And so it reminds us that historically, mole was associated with chemical reactions. But in fact, a mole is just one Avogadro's number or whatever, apples, yeah. oranges, people or electrons. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's such a huge quantity, 10 to the 23, that uh, whatever corresponds to that, it becomes a microscopic quantity. So therefore, this Faraday constant is a, is a very nice way to connect macroscopic with microscopic quantities. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, you list the Gibbs equation, and I think, you know, what's also very instructive for students is this is when you're looking at it. I mean, anytime I see Q there, in other words, some reaction quotient or something, that's when I think of it, you know, okay, we're looking at things while things are happening, not in equilibrium, right? And so, you know, getting from this to kind of an equilibrium equation where the delta G will be, you know, zero, um, and, you know, therefore, you'll look at, um, and this Q will switch over to, you know, the equilibrium constant, you know, for it, you know, I think is, is oftentimes, you know, very instructive for students to see, because oftentimes when students are looking at this, they'll be looking at some equilibrium constant, some equilibrium value. Right. And, and then this, I mean, this connection is so important. The fact that this is equal to delta G, you can think of this as an independent equation. And then you get this other one that connects delta G to delta G standard plus the, this RT log Q term. Now, in principle, and they are two independent equations, but now the presence of this common guy here, delta G, makes this amazing connection. I mean, at least that's what you think. But if you, if you, if you go back to the initial argument, you realize that this is a natural connection between the change in delta G induced by this work term and the change, the change in G connected to the, 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 the reaction fact, the reaction itself. Yeah. So now we have a way to connect everything we have learned about chemical reactions, including delta G is smaller than zero for a spontaneous reaction, all the connection, because we have this equation and we also have the other connection, delta G equal to delta H minus T delta okay. S. So this, these three equations, they allow us to connect delta S and delta H 
with electrochemical changes now, if you if we wish to do it that way. Yeah. Because now we have these three equations that come together because of the this incredibly deep equation, this this keep free energy and definition that connects the three things. Yeah. And you know, I think also just from a you know, practical standpoint for students, it means that, you know, now all those things they went in, uh, you know, they originally worked, you know, because where everything was defined to date was, you know, through kind of looking at the delta G based on its, you know, enthalpy and entropies and, and stuff. And so they've been calculating this for reactions, you know, using kind of Gibbs equation. Now they can go back and do the same things, all those same reactions, looking up, you know, a lot of these, instead of in kilojoules per mole, which is how they're going to find, you know, how they've worked almost everything to date, sometimes kilocalories in, in biochemistry, usually kilojoules. Now they can go back and redo all those things, um, you know, in electrochemical cells with voltages and really, you know, make sure they can, you know, do them in, in a sense, both capacities. Uh, right. And if we, if we look at... You see, and here, okay, so now we put the two things together, and this is what is usually called Nernst equation. So it, give, it looks exactly, exactly like, like it delta the yeah. G equal to delta G naught minus RT log Q. And then you see what we said before, the fact that this number of electrons is there makes this an intensive quantity, whereas delta G is, if you... If you think of the whole reaction, it's an extensive quantity. And just so, what we showed below, right, too, right, like right, that usually we're, you know, if we're not looking at it while we're in flux of a reaction, but we're looking at it at equilibrium, you know, where, you know, we get the same thing, just like we would with delta G being equal to zero, right. you know, the electrochemical cell. And then we can look at it, you know, ver you know with respect to some standard state. Yeah. Yeah. And then... I mean, why is this so important, both in chemistry and biochemistry? Well, in the case of biochemistry, we know that the, the, this is a, a rough picture of a cell. And then we know that all exchange... That is a very rough picture of a cell. Yes, very yeah. rough picture. It looks like an egg. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, so, that's so, definitely a theorist uh, picture uh, of a cell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all ion exchange, everything having to, you know, going in and out a cell is controlled by electrochemical potentials. So this is why it's so important that when, when we talk about ion transport, uh, even electron transport, that we understand that this connection is there. So each time we are saying that we are trying to move, let's say this type of ions in and out the cell, we know that we need to describe the electrochemical potential for this to happen. And, and this is such an important process in, a, in our bodies. Well, and like you said, like there's a reason, even when they learned about the Gibbs free energy before electrochemistry, you know, one of the things, you know, I always love to stress is they learned about a potential. It was the chemical potential, right? Like, yeah. I mean, in a sense, like, you know, it's surprising we don't put things in anytime somebody says a potential, Almost any time when you put it in that terms, you think voltage, you think, you know, electron volts or, or voltage directly. And like you said, like, I mean, when, you know, uh, the chemistry of life and the chemistry in cells is aqueous chemistry. These are always ions, you know, moving around. Like you said, one of the first things they learn about, right, are, you know, sodium potassium pumps. And like you said, and you know, you're hard pressed to find a cell where there's not a potential difference between the outside and inside. It's it's what drives a lot of life type processes. Yeah, absolutely. And and even death processes. <laughs> <laughs> we we shouldn't mention it here, but uh, if, if, they, if there is going to be an execution with a lethal injection, then we know that one of the things they do is that change dramatically we, the concentration of Potassium. Or potassium, so to cause a heart attack, a heart failure. Yeah. This is the way it happens. And it's, uh, it's terrible, but what it means is that we can use our knowledge of science to do great things and to do very nasty mm. things. And we humans, we, don't, we, we do both. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Ah. Well, thanks for the discussion today. <laughs>